Good evening. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm the Vice President and Director of Route to Consumer and Sales Operations for Brown Foreman and a Filson Historical Society board member. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. Making Bourbon, Making Landscape, Kentucky's 19th century transition from craft to industrial distilling. It's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Carl Rapes. Dr. Rapes is a professor emeritus of geography at the University of Kentucky and author of Bourbon Backroads, A Journey Through Kentucky's Distilling Landscape. He is co-editor of the Great Valley Road of Virginia, Shenandoah Landscapes from Prehistory to the Present and co-author of Rock Fences of Bluegrass. A longtime student of culture and its material artifacts, Carl has spent the past 35 years examining the way people have created American landscapes. His field-based research interests blend rural and urban context, especially within Middle West, Appalachia, and South. His past work examinations of the relationships between European immigrants and occupational pre-adaptation, pre the social construction of sport and leisure places, and the creation of landscape symbol vocabularies. He is currently working on several projects relating to the spectacular role of the road in its many guises and through its many commercial, political, and technical patrons as a shaping influence on landscapes. Dr. Patrick Lewis will moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. And I will now turn the program over to Dr. Rapes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for signing up and participating uh, in this particular project this evening. I want to thank the uh, Felsen Historical Society for the invitation and Chris Brown for that very generous introduction. Uh, if we could have the slide uh, show, please. I'd like to preface my comments by saying something obvious to most Kentucky residents, and that is Kentucky's distilleries have long identified with their locales and their regions. When considered together or corporately and juxtaposed with their complementary industries, in other words, farming, cooperage, transportation, and others, and the physical environment, the state's distilleries form a distinctive landscape and the industry has a unique identity not replicated elsewhere in the nation. Next, please. Let me say a few things about landscape because as a historical geographer, uh, these are uh, at the center of my thinking and the way I, I look at problems. Landscapes are physical entities and forms of knowledge. They are catalogs of decision-making. Landscapes are also palimpsests of environmental features and cultural artifacts representing hist <clears throat> successful, successive historical layers of occupants, change, and meaning. Landscape interpretation about places emphasizes relationships between process, pattern, and place. Next. By process, we're talking about how things are made, how things work, and how they change through time. By pattern, we mean the regular or repeating forms produced by physical, social, and economic processes. And by place, we emphasize how spatial and temporal processes create distinctive places. Next. When we apply this to bourbon distilling, we see Kentucky's di contemporary distilling landscape includes patterns of still visible residuals of the 19th century. Present day landscapes represent conjunctions of interconnected processes through time. And I'll be talking about several of those conjunctions as we go along this evening. Selected landscape images, images are iconic. 
and employed in contemporary bourbon marketing. Next. We see that, for example, at the present day Jim Beam Distillery at Claremont. The visitor center there, which we are seeing here in the center of the photograph, was completed in 2013. But it's a replica of a much older structure uh, that had to be torn down in order to make way for new buildings and new technology. Next. Let me give you a brief primer on, bur on bourbon, which given the audience, I suspect no one needs this, but I'll put it up here for those who are not initiated. Bourbon is a whiskey, also spelled without the E, distilled from fermented mash of corn, a minimum of 51%, rye or wheat and malted barley. Bourbon must be aged by law in new white oak barrels that have been fire charred inside. Distilleries are variously con configured, but will house equipment for storing and grinding grain, fermenting a mash of water, yeast, and mill grain, distilling alcohol from mash, filling and storing barrels, bottling and shipping. Byproducts are spent mash or slop and used barrels. Next. Courtesy of Harper's Magazine in the 19th century, uh, we have a 19th century farm still here. It could be most anywhere in the South. In the right-hand side, we see a firebox under a lean-to shed uh, roof on the, on the left. We see a small log cabin uh, with uh, some barrels outside. The barrels could be fermenting bats. Uh, they could be storage for finished product. Uh, keep this in mind now as a reminder for how this is going to change uh, as we go through the 19th century. Next. A bourbon census to remind us of where we've been. In 1810, there are an estimated 2,200 uh, distilleries in Kentucky. Fayette County, by the way, where I am tonight, has 139 distilleries in 1810. By 1840, the number had dropped to 889. And between 1864 and 1894, the number varied as high as 225 and as low as 100 less than that. By 1919, on the eve of prohibition, there were still 183 distilleries. During prohibition from 1920 to 1933, six distilleries were licensed to produce medicinal whiskey primarily. 2012, there were 10 craft and industrial scale distilleries. And a year and a half ago, there were 73 and that number is climbing. Next. Let's have a brief look at the distribution of those 889 distilleries in 1840. The larger bluegrass area, which I'll explain with another map here in a few moments, which is just to the right center of your map, including Nelson County, Washington, Harrison, and so on, is appears on this map to be the core of the industry as of 1840. There's a cluster of distilleries in the southeastern coal field. And there's another cluster in the south central uh, eastern part of the Penny Royal. Next. Now, something very interesting happens when you look at the number of gallons produced per distillery in 1840, as opposed to the number of distilleries, which we just looked at in the previous map. The smallest circles that you see on the map represent gallons per distillery of less than 5,000 annually. And the graduated circles above that uh, read as high as 100,000 gallons per distillery per annum. 
Uh, notice the obvious alignment from Boone, Gallatin to Trimble County of the largest distilleries in the state in terms of gallons produced per year. It's not where you might think it would be. It's on the Ohio River. And we begin to see the heavy industrialization of uh, distilling in Kentucky first on the most accessible transport routeways, which is in this case, the Ohio River. Uh, a little bit later, uh, by the 1870s, uh, the big distilleries in Boone County are gonna be producing well over 500,000 gallons per year. Next. And then if we skip forward to 1894, down to 170 distilleries now. And distilling has essentially disappeared from Eastern Kentucky, largely from the Penny Royal. And it's retreated to what would it, we would later see as the core of the distilling region. Uh, Jefferson on the Ohio River, uh, one of the largest producers by 1894, as is uh, Owensboro in Davis County in Western Kentucky. But you'll notice that Nelson County, Anderson County, Harrison County are also major producers. Next. The first of the conjunctions that we want to talk about briefly this evening brings together distilling in the context of the physical environment. And by physical environment, we talking about climate, the cycles and seasonality and weather, the geology, the bedrock and its constituent components, hydrology, that is underground and surface water, soils, <clears throat> the plant supporting medium of silt, sand, clay, and other minerals, and organic material derived from bedrock and vegetation, and topography, the earth's surface is a product of land forming processes. Next. Our map of physiographic regions, and I would hope uh, after you've read the book, if you are not already familiar with this map, it will be emblazoned on your cerebral cortex. Uh, the brown area in the center of the bluegrass, labeled number one, is the inner bluegrass. Number two, the yellow area surrounding the uh, inner bluegrass is the Eden Shale. The area three and the kind of ochre color, kind of a horseshoe around uh, the inner bluegrass and Eden Shale on the west and on the east is the outer bluegrass. We'll, we'll be spending time this evening talking primarily about production in those uh, three areas. Another semicircle, uh, another horseshoe is a green area number four, which is the knobs. And we'll not pay much attention at all to number six, Penny Royal, Western Coal Field, or the Jackson Purchase. What I'd like to do now is take you on a quick transect by aerial photography from the left side or west side of the inner bluegrass in Woodford County into the outer, uh, into the Eden Shale, the yellow, in Western Anderson County and then into number three, the outer bluegrass in Nelson County. Next. If you've flown into one of our local airports, you've either seen the inner bluegrass or the outer bluegrass over at Louisville, and you've seen scenes like this. Uh, very fertile soil, uh, open field agriculture, uh, tobacco, as we see here in the middle distance, and pasturage for livestock. Next. The Eden Shale next to it is radically different. We are in Western Anderson County here. Uh, this area is part shale, part limestone. The shale erodes very easily. Uh, it produces very steep slopes, sharply uh, dissected topography and has semi infertile soils. Next. And where the Eden Shale segues into the outer bluegrass here in Northeast Nelson County, we see a borderline or almost running right through the middle of the photograph. The, the road following the splice 
between the outer bluegrass at the bottom and the Eden shale at the top. Next. Now, what we were looking at in terms of soil, and we're, we're interested in this because distillers are going to be consuming large quantities of grain, especially corn, and that grain has to come from nearby, at least initially. So the inner bluegrass area, the IBG that we were looking at a moment ago, is characterized by Maury McAfee soils, deep, loamy, fertile, uh, rolling up lands, which we saw in the photograph, uh, karst, which is a, a solution of limestone topography, that is sinkholes, underground caves and caverns, and this landscape is suited for intensive agriculture. The next ring we saw, Eden Shale, the Eden soils are shallow, stony, steep, they're low fertility, and they're suited primarily for woodland. And finally, in the outer bluegrass, the OBG, the predominant soil uh, category here is Pembroke, which like the Moray McAfee in the inner bluegrass is deep, loamy, fertile, low gradient and suited for intensive agriculture. The climate is humid continental, and that means warm summers and cool winters. Uh, although we have a different kind of testimony outside right now. The growing season varies from 165 to 200 days. Precipitation varies from 44 to 50 inches on average. And the interesting part of that is about 50% of the precipitation occurs between April and September or during growing season to the great advantage of farmers. There are parallel calendars for agriculture and distilling in terms of this seasonality. Next. This is a general physiographic map of uh, Nelson, Washington, and Marion counties showing us how those three areas fall out. Uh, the outer bluegrass is the uh, medium gray color, the Eden shale in the upper uh, right or east uh, is the darker gray, and an area that we saw on the map earlier, the knobs, uh, gives us a semicircle from uh, Dietzville area all the way down to south uh, uh, Marion County, and a little tiny bit of the eastern Penny Royal at the bottom, very bottom. We are going to find that distilling in this particular area is concentrated strongly in the outer bluegrass and the knobs. Next. We mentioned seasonality briefly, and in the 19th century, uh, seasonality of climate uh, plays a very important role in agriculture and its sequencing with distilling. We have the annual warm season cold season climate cycle, of course, and that means for farmers, they're going to be doing fall or spring planting, summer and fall harvest, and they have to be conscious of labor availability during planting and harvest, and to a certain extent uh, during the husbandry of those fields during the summertime, during the growing season. Grain production, of course, is going to be of premium interest to uh, distillers and labor availability is also going to be of interest to distillers. And we have to all cons also consider the time demands of corn. Now corn, as we saw a little bit earlier, is the major constituent of uh, bourbon distilling. But corn is an unusual crop. It does not fit in the same category with wheat, rye, uh, oats, or other grains. Machinery such as mowers, wind rowers, harvesters of various kinds, and threshing machines were adapted, uh, invented and adapted mid 19th century and readily applied to grain production. We cannot say the same for corn. Corn was really a 11 month a year crop, whether we considered planting, 
or we consider uh, harvesting, uh, shucking, and shelling before it ever is available for the distiller. The distiller's calendar is somewhat different. Uh, the distilling did not begin until late fall and then extended to late spring. Their production cycle, in other words, followed on agriculture. This relates in part to favorable distilling temperatures during the cool months, but it also relates to grain availability. After all, harvest had just com been completed. It also related to labor availability. Uh, we have some documents that tell us, for example, that distillers were not keen to use year old grain in distilling. They wanted fresh grain that was newly harvested. Related activity, cooperage and timber cutting, teamsters, railroads, and river boats, and distilling, manufacturing, and sales also had seasonality that needs to be considered. Next. Andrew Oots and his sons operated a cooperage on West Main Street in Lexington uh, during the latter part of the 19th century. And we see on this graph a total of the number of slack barrels and tight barrels that the Oots cooperage produced uh, during the year 1892 and 1893. Slack barrels are barrels that are intended for dry products. Uh, flour is put up and sold in dry in slack barrels, as are apples, fruits and vegetables, and so on. Tight barrels are intended for liquid, and whiskey barrels are tight barrels, and uh, they are a good deal more demanding to make more exacting in their requirements than our slack barrels. So if we look at the calendar for what Oots Cooperage was producing, and on my screen, the slack barrel graph is on the right hand, or the uh, scale is on the right hand side, and you'll see it goes from zero to 80. The tight barrel scale is on the left hand side, and that goes from zero to 800. So the dash line indicates mixed size slack barrels. And you can see that in July, perhaps this is apple harvest time, uh, vegetable gardening uh, tidying up, uh, is when the peak of the slack barrel production occurs. The tight barrels intended for whiskey, a uh, production there begins in September and gradually increases so that by uh, April, uh, we are producing over 600 barrels per week at the Oots Distillery. Next. Conjunctions number two, uh, distilling and 19th century technology transformations. Again, mating together agriculture and industry. In agriculture, uh, there's an axiom we want to keep in mind here, and that is Handcrafted technologies are directly influenced and adapted uh, to environmental conditions. Uh, the evolution here is a transition from subsistence to commercial agriculture during the 19th century. And what enables this change are a series of inventions and innovations. And some of those inventions involve grain production, planting, harvesting machines that we mentioned a little bit earlier, all of which will produce production or increase production capacities. At the same time, industry is changing and it is evolving and trans transitioning from vernacular hand craft work to mechanized mass production. The enabling factors here are again, interventions and innovations, but as applied to distilling and related processes. An example here is Oliver Evans. Uh, Oliver Evans was born in the 1750s in Delaware. He spent most of his uh, uh, productive years in Philadelphia. Uh, he is an early pioneer in steam uh, engine uh, building and manufacturing. Uh, 
and his inventions revolutionized the milling industry. And we have another axiom that we want to keep in the backs of our minds here. Inventions and innovations are accretive. And what we mean by that is the acceptance of an invention stimulates further invention if productivity and profits increase and invention and innovation reduce environmental influence. Next. This is Weisenberger Mill on South Elkhorn Creek. This is a very early 20th century mill site, but creeks across the inner bluegrass, outer bluegrass uh, had mills like this uh, up and down each creek during the 19th century. Uh, the reason I wanted to call this to your attention is that the building is a three-story mill and it's Oliver Evans technology that allowed mills to go from one story high to three stories high and to make it into a vertical process rather than a horizontal process, which reduced labor requirements and increased proficiency. Next. Technology's tools for distilling, include, which began as a vernacular craft and using locally made equipment. When you have locally made equipment by a local mechanic, each piece is unique, each is idiosyncratic. All of this evolves into a mechanized industry by adopting inventions and innovations that yielded standardized general purpose mechanicals. Oak cooperage, sheet copper, iron pipe, brass valves, leather belting, reciprocating steam engines, Increasing scale supported complementary industries, such as, for example, the Robeson Brass Foundry in Newport and the Bourbon Copper and Brass Works in Cincinnati. They were supplying specialized dedicated equipment, grain mills, custom copper stills, corrosion resistant hardware, barrel rack storage systems, and so on. Next. Now, we just mentioned the Robeson Brass Works in Newport. William and his brother George Robeson patented an improved alcohol still in 1869, and this is the still drawing that they submitted to the patent office. If you hark back to that first slide we saw of the farm still in the early 19th century, with the log cabin and the open uh, air firebox, and you compare it to this, uh, a mere 60 years later, uh, you can see the quantum leap that's been made in technology. Uh, the Robeson distillery includes two fireboxes, not one. The firebox on the lower right is underneath a traditional pot still or a limbic. The firebox labeled A in the middle on the bottom uh, is heating a water tank, shown here as a cylinder, and that water tank steam uh, goes into the bottom of the column still, which is depicted here as a wood structure. Uh, it comes out of the top as vapor, which goes into the D structure, the smaller still next to it, which is a doubler, and the vapor from there goes into a cooling tank uh, where it will be condensed into vapor. What an extraordinary difference 60 years makes in terms of distilling technology. Next. Now, that, distill, uh, that distilling equipment that you just saw is going to begin to appear in distillery buildings that are very unlike the one that we saw with the log cabin uh, and the open firebox. This is a Paul Sawyer painting uh, labeled 1870 of the Old Crow Distillery in Glens Creek in Woodford County. And you can see the distilling building roughly in right center with a chimney uh, suggesting that there's a steam engine working, uh, giving the flow of smoke from the chimney. That building looks very much like a vernacular barn building of the same period. Just to the left of the large distilling building, 
is a low building that is the cooperage. You can see uh, a stack of uh, slats or uh, lumber there out in front that's going to be converted into barrels. On the left, upper left, you'll see a stack warehouse that is awaiting barrels of the finished product. Down in the lower front, we see the distiller's house. And between the distiller's house and the uh, stack warehouse, we see a little cabin or cottage that is probably the office of the storekeeper and the gauger, who are federal uh, Internal Revenue Service representatives, and that is probably their office. Uh, the painting is dated 1870. Uh, the law, Internal Revenue Service laws that changed the taxing structure and the way that structure would be maintained uh, is 1868, two years before this painting. Next. A few years later, John Peden, who was a resident of Anderson County, uh, patented this still arrangement in 1886. And the distinguishing feature here is the tall column still, uh, which is not Mr. Peden's invention. The tall column still on the right here uh, is actually a product of inventions, especially in Scotland and England, uh, during the 1830s and 40s, and credit is often given to a person by the name of Arrhenius Coffey, uh, who has uh, made the vertical still that became popular and is the antecedent of the one that we see here. Next. Now, if we have a column still that is in excess of 30 feet high, and modern day still, uh, column stills are much higher than that, we need a much larger industrial uh, building to put it in. This is the old Taylor distillery on Glens Creek, not very far from that old Crow distillery painting of Paul Sawyer's that you saw a moment ago in 1910. And we have in the upper right, uh, the Taylor distillery with the tall chimney. We have a railroad track running down beside Glens Creek and three very large warehouses on the creek side and a couple of older warehouses on the hillside beyond. This is full-blown industrial scale distilling. Next. And that landscape signature, that tall still building comes down to us today. And our example here is from Maker's Mark uh, Distillery, a contemporary photograph, of course. Um, the tall structure there houses the steel, but it also houses uh, grain milling um, equipment, which is suggested by the large granary tanks on the bottom and the presence of that thousand bushel truck that is unloading on the apron right down in front. Next. This is the first bourbon distillery that I've been able to identify in Bourbon County. You know, the Jacob Spears Distillery in seven, as of 1795. Uh, the distillery itself is gone. Spring House is in the right front. But the warehouse where the finished product was stacked and, and, and stored uh, is in the middle distance there on the left. A very basic two-story uh, stone building. Next. The largest of the stack warehouses of this earlier period that I've found uh, is on the old Clay Stoll Company distilling warehouse property uh, north of Lexington. Uh, and a few years ago, this was part of the Hill and Meyer nursery complex. By stack warehouse, I mean uh, whiskey barrels are stored by stacking them one on top of the other. And it's usually the case uh, during this period that a filled bourbon barrel would be about 450 pounds, perhaps a little bit more. And if you stack those four high on top of one another, uh, the pressure on the first or the bottom barrel is gonna be in excess of half a ton. Uh, so there is danger if you go much higher than four high uh, with a, in, in a stack warehouse, you're going to have unwanted spillages. 
Uh, air does not circulate well underneath or between barrels that are stacked. And this leads to the formation of mold and an undesirable taint of, of, of whiskey, it was thought. And there are other reasons why uh, a stack warehouse uh, is not desirable if you have an alternative, uh, one of which being uh, the first whiskey distilled, in other words, your oldest product, ends up at the bottom of the stack. And because you're going to want to sell that first, that means uh, you have to unstack everything to get to your uh, oldest uh, product. Next. In 1879-1880, an Alsatian immigrant by the name of Friedrich Stitzel invented a barrel rack storage system that is going to revolutionize the distilling landscape. Uh, we have his patent drawing here, and it shows us what you will see today if you visit along the Bourbon Trail, uh, any of the new, uh, sorry, any of the old uh, distilling warehouses that are open to the public. Uh, a series of vertically stacked racks, which allow you to uh, stack barrels in such a way so that you can pull any barrel out of any stack, no matter how high it is, uh, or when it was put in the distillery uh, at will. And it will also allow for better air circulation through the stack. Next. To make all this work, you need a hoisting machine. And this is Henry Reedy's hoisting machine circa 1871. Next. And that allows you to build entire warehouses as rack systems uh, for storage of whiskey. This is uh, Maker's Mark west of Loretto. Next. When that uh, warehouse is finished, you simply hang the skin on it, install your oyster elevator in the end here, and you are ready for storage. Next. And if you add all those together, uh, you get it a distillery warehouse farm, as we see here at Loretto. Next. Conjunctions two, transportation. Locational inertia operates such that uh, if you do not have good transportation, your resource base is confined, as is your production capacity and your sales reach. Inertia is overcome by adopting new transportation technologies. The enabling factor here are inventions and innovations. These include turnpikes, steam engines applied to boats and railroads, which permit, permit raw material and product a range of movement over long distances at lower cost. Next. This is the New Haven New Hope Turnpike in Southern Nelson County. Uh, circa 1889, and it is the turnpike that is going to revolutionize the delivery of corn and grain to distilleries in rural areas and the ability of distilleries to market their product. Next. The people who built those roads largely were Irish immigrants. This is the David Dernan household. David and his wife Mary are uh, Irish immigrants. David, as you can see, is a road contractor. There are 21 people living in the house with David and his wife. 12 of them are from Ireland. Nine of them are turnpikers. Next. When we look at all of the turnpikes that were chartered in Kentucky during the 19th century, uh, we can make a graph showing all 1,400 of them and a reminder that the state and the counties were not in the business of making roads in the 19th century. If you wanted a road, you built it yourself, and you built it through obtaining a charter from the legislature, and that's what we're looking at here. You then hired a crew such as David Dernan to build the high turnpike for you. Two graphs, the one on the bottom, the larger graph, looking primarily at the uh, gray graph lines, show us the number of turnpikes completed in any given year for the entire state. The most uh, active years are between the major recessions 
1837, 1857, 1873 were major depression periods and turnpike construction fell off dramatically. But what I wanna call your attention to are the black lines on the graph, which I put together in the small inset graph on the upper left. Uh, these uh, distilleries, uh, sorry, these um, uh, roads were built primarily for an access to distilleries. Uh, they are from uh, uh, six counties that include the major distilling counties, Nelson, Anderson, uh, Woodford, and so on. And what you can summarize here is that the 5% line down on the bottom is highlighted in gray. And almost all of those distilling counties, which make up 5% of the state's counties, are producing way over 5% of the state's turnpikes. And you can see that in some years, 20%, at least 10%, if not 20% of all turnpikes are in these six counties, not spread evenly across the state. Clearly the distillers are interested in getting grain to their uh, uh, works and product to the market. Next. Steam is applied to steamboats meant that the old Taylor distillery that we see here on in suburban Frankfurt uh, on the Kentucky River uh, had access to steamboats provided that the rivers were navigable. Next. Uh, steam provided uh, railroad tracks and uh, railroad cars evolved along with everything else. Uh, this is a L&N 1878 gondola car. And this is what ear corn was shipped into distilleries. Next. And an interesting thing happened when, when railroads were built throughout the distilling regions. Uh, we see in Nelson County here, a railroad track running from Dietzville to Bardstown and then uh, east to early times. And down at the bottom, we see another LNN railroad track running from Boston to New Haven to New Hope. And if you look at both uh, tracks, you'll see that uh, what happened when railroads came to the distilling areas is that distillers often, not always, but often abandoned their sites beside springs and streams and relocated their distilleries to railroad tracks. And you see that uh, blow up on the lower left-hand corner showing us the Pottinger Creek area in Southern Nelson County, almost a solid line of distilleries along the railroad track. Next. Something similar happened in Jefferson County in Louisville. Uh, if we look at the two blow ups on the top, you can see that most of the post Civil War distilleries there are lined along railroad tracks or which do not show up very well here on railroad track sidings. Next. If we visit Deetsville today, we'll see the old uh, Samuels distillery uh, right against the railroad tracks. This is probably a 1930s version of what the older distillery was in this site, now relocated to the railroad tracks. Next. Conjunctions for management and labor. Craft distilleries included farmers running their own operations, millers and distillers, it was a local and vernacular operation. Uh, industrial management was regional and national and very entrepreneurial. The labor force was essentially the same for both agriculture and uh, industry. There were migrants, immigrants, slaves and freedmen and women, uh, whether they were owned or hired after 1863. Two quick examples here of the Elkhorn Distillery and the McKenna Distillery. Next. A tale of two distilleries. Elkhorn is in Scott County, operated from 1868 to 1872. McKenna in northern Nelson County in the outer bluegrass, operated from 1855 to 1919. 
next. The Elkhorn Distillery was owned and operated by James Stone and a partner, James Shropshire. Stone was a uh, farmer and a merchant distiller. Uh, his farm included 337 acres improved land, 110 acres of woodland. He specialized in livestock production, uh, some milk cattle, oxen, sheep, and hogs. He produced wool butter and about 750 bushels of corn in 1870. He was the county's leading distiller, producing about 30 barrels of whiskey per day, operating from November to June. He purchased and distilling grains, corn, rye, malted barley, and hops through agents and suppliers in Owen, Scott, Shelby, Woodford uh, counties, Cincinnati, and Louisville. He had accounts with bankers in Midway, that's Midway, Kentucky, Paris, Maysville, Lexington, Louisville, Cincinnati, and New York City. Next. James Stone was a slave owner. He owned 23 slaves prior to 1863, uh, eight males, nine females, and six children. You can speculate here about the nature of his labor force. Next. His distillery was located beside Elkhorn Creek, topographic map showing us here uh, right up against the Woodford County border, about a mile and a half away from Midway. Next. Is still shown on the left here is no longer existing, but the foundation is a 45 by 45 foot square. The whiskey warehouse that he built still stands. Uh, that was about 114 feet long, 44 feet wide with solid brick walls, 25 inches thick. Next. That's the warehouse as you see it today on the Great House Farm and it is today used as a horse barn and you notice that it's built into the side of a hill so that the first floor is partly underground. Next. Elkhorn Distillery Transport Links, the distillery is two and a half miles away from Payne's Depot on the Illinois Railroad. He received grain, coal, livestock, and building materials from the depot. He shipped out livestock and whiskey. At harvest, he received wheat and white rye, shipped in sacks, shell corn in sacks and barrels, and his ear corn arrived in bulk on the gondola cars that we saw earlier. He returned all his sacks to his shippers. He paid Teamsters a dollar a day to haul goods. Corn cost him 60 to 75 cents per bushel and a dollar per bushel delivered at the depot. Rye was a good deal more expensive at $1.30. He stored grain in pens, he called them, on his distillery property. He marketed his whiskey to wholesale agents in Louisville, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Boston, New York City, New Orleans, and Galveston. If he could get it, he priced his whiskey at $2 a gallon. Uh, that often was not the case. Next. His cooper was a German immigrant by the name of Adam Michaels, who produced tight barrels, mash beer, and fermenting tubs. And he obtained his Pittsburgh hoop iron for his barrels from Belknap Hardware in Louisville. Next. Elkhorn Stillery byproduct was spent mash or distillery slop. Uh, many early distilleries disposed of their slop by dumping it into the nearest creek, although many later sold it or used it as livestock feed, which James Stone did. He fed his slop to cattle and hogs at the distillery and contracted to sell slop to local farmers who transported it in barrels and tank wagons. He's uh, selling fatted stock and slop became a rival though limited source of income. Next. Unfortunately, all of this was on the road to bankruptcy. Stone and Shropshire uh, experienced increasing financial difficulties. They had to pay a high cost for their raw materials, their equipment, and transportation was exceedingly expensive. Their market was depressed by overproduction in general across the country. 
and he was not able to sell his whiskey at profitable prices. Making things worse, the internal revenue taxes he had to pay, uh, he had to pay before the whiskey could be sold. And that tax in 1868 was $4 a barrel and 50 cents a gallon. After exhausting their savings, Stone and Shropshire borrowed operating funds from banks and businesses, and the businesses business terminated in 1872. Next. Let me give you a quick thumbnail sketch of Henry McKenna's distillery. Henry McKenna was born in Draperstown in O'Derry, Ireland in 1813. He established a grist mill at Fairfield in Nelson County about 1855. The mill was on an east fork of Cox's Creek and the Fairfield Bloomfield Turnpike with turnpike links south to Bardstown and west to Louisville. He built his distillery beside the mill. His income, draw, he, uh, he drew his income from milling flour, meal, and bran for area farmers. Uh, he operated a wood-fired steam engine. He was not a slave owner, but may, he may have rented slaves from area owners. He was a pre-railroad distillery and he never directly connected to the rail lines. His turnpike link to the Samuels Distillery Railroad Depot 12 miles to the south. Next. And here is the Fairfield Samuels Depot Turnpike. Can you imagine navigating that with a wagon load of full barrels? Next. Henry McKenna also became a farmer. In 15 years, he acquired 140 acres of improved land. Uh, almost twice as much of woodland. That's way above the state average of 158 acres. And he had become what the Irish call a strong farmer. Uh, he produced a few livestock, especially 225 hogs, uh, 700 bushels of winter wheat, 1,500 bushels of corn, some oats, and hay. His distillery used 50 bushels of grain per day. And if you discount the corn that he fed to livestock, uh, that was sufficient for about five weeks of distilling. In other words, he has to buy grain from someone else. Next. This is Fairfield, circa 1879. Uh, the distillery is on the main road here, just east of Fairfield. South of the distillery, towards the bottom, you can see Henry McKenna's house on top of the hill. Just downhill from St. Michael's Church, you will see Patrick Sweeney's house and son, Stanford McKenna's house is off to the left. Next. Henry McKenna's business organization, by the 1870s, he was carrying the accounts of more, hundred, more than 350 town residents, farmers, grocers in Bardstown, and whiskey wholesalers in Louisville. Uh, frequent sales of flour and meal by the bushel and the barrel. He charged 70 cents to mill a barrel of flour or 196 pounds. He bought cordwood in quantity, probably to fire his steam engine. He sold slop to local farmers and by the 1880s was feeding slop to cattle and hogs. He had two coopers working for him. They rented his cooperage shop and McKenna paid him $1.85 per whiskey barrel. Next. His distiller was Irish. We saw his house on the map a moment ago. Patrick Sweeney was also born in County Derry in Ireland, 1841. By 1860, he was boarding with the McKenna family and became the McKenna's distiller that year. Henry McKenna paid him $450 a year and he lived in a house near the distillery beside the cattle and hog pens. Mr. Sweeney maintained a charge account with McKenna still and was able to draw goods from it. In the 1860s and 70s, Sweeney supported the Irish Fenian Society with annual donations. Next. A quick look at a map of 1910 of the McKenna complex. Uh, we see the distillery and the granary office uh, and, uh, as uh, a center of things a hog pen standing on top of Cox's Creek, bonded warehouse across the road, and a uh, bottling house uh, also 
across the turnpike and notice the whiskey pipe that crosses the road here to the Waddling House next. An aerial photograph of the present day McKenna Distillery site. You can see the distillery complex with a new building there on the left and on the right of the road, the Waddling House and notice the gantry next. The gantry now seen from bottom view is still there. Uh, this carried the whiskey pipe from the distillery behind us here across the road to the bottling house. Next. McKenna specialized when uh, things got tough in making medicinal whiskey. And he had sales agents from Boston all the way to New Mexico territory. And the temperance movement was making difficult uh, things difficult for everyone in the distilling industry. And to cope with that, McKenna developed an extensive mail order business for medicinal whiskey to supplement local and regional sales. He placed advertisements in medical journals and printed circulars for distribution on trains and business locations. Next. This is one of his uh, uh, ads taken out of the Medical Herald published in uh, bar in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, in about 1887. He's advertising himself as producing Nelson County Pure Old Line Sour Mash Whiskey, uh, distillery and warehouse in Fairfield. And by that time, they had an office on 4th Avenue, now 4th Street in Louisville. Next. His legacy is as follows. He died in 1893. His business was subsequently managed by his three sons, Daniel, James S. and Stafford. He continued in production until Prohibition in 1919. In 1934, after Prohibition ended, the distillery was reopened by two of his sons. They renovated the distillery and warehouses and were producing uh, or, or consuming 500 bushels of grain per day. 1941 sold the business to Seagram's that produced industrial alcohol during World War II. The facility closed in 1984, uh, 1974. Now contrast this with the Elkhorn Distillery. For the McKenna's, milling and distilling was a far and farming were companion businesses. This was local scale, but they had a national reach. There was full family involvement, creative management, advertising, and they used local financing and self-financing. He had income from the mill after all. Next. This is the ground view of that post-prohibition distillery building that still stands. Next. Our next to last slide summarizing all of this Distilling structures were planned, built, used, abandoned, and raised. At each state, the relationship to place and environment changed, and the landscape's meaning changed or transposed. Distilleries were the owner's investment, the banker's debtor, the farmer's market, the laborer's employment, the imbiber's purveyor, the prohibitionist engine of intemperance, the tax collector's bottomless reservoir from which to siphon largesse. The contemporary distilling landscape embeds the new into the old. New technology often housed in historic buildings. This reflects industrialization, yet it also promotes an iconic image of craft heritage. We now have a program on the part of many distilleries of reclaiming relic distilleries, aging bourbon in traditional warehouses, constructing heritage visitor centers. And we have over 20 distilleries, distillery buildings, and distillers houses on the National Register for Historic Places. Marketing strategies today utilize advertising, labeling, and tours which feature the industry's soul. Brands recall historic distillers such as Elijah Craig and William Weller. They recall historic places, Knob Creek and Lowen's Mill are examples. 
and they venerate the old, as in Old Crow, Old Fitzgerald, Old Forrester, Old Pogue, and of course, very old Barton. Next. Our last image, the Brown Game Distillery, Woodford County, 1838. And if you take the tour here, you will see in the old distillery building, 1838 carved into the stone. Restored by Brian Brown Foreman in 1896, that is 1986, listed on the National Register in 1995, and a major achievement designated a National Historical Monument in the year 2000. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Rates. I, I really did enjoy that. Um, I would point out to everyone uh, watching right now, we have posted a link down in the chat that'll take you to our donation page if you'd like to continue support Filson programming. We certainly would appreciate that. Um, I'd like to ask a question. I was really fascinated looking at those maps we, we looked at early on about that concentration of the geography of distilling from all of those rural counties into these uh, core areas. I wonder if there's a, a similar concentration um, in neighboring states um, and, and sort of leaving Kentucky standing alone in bourbon production as we seem to do now. When does that occur? If, if I can jump industries for a second uh, and look at the wine industry, uh, there you have concentrations that are uh, known throughout the country, Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, Willamette Valley, Oregon, and so on. Uh, but the, as we saw on that table, that census of distilleries, uh, the number of distilleries dropped off precipitously. And so the concentration, at least in Kentucky, uh, coalesced on the best agricultural land. Uh, that's where the crops are going to come from that are going to fuel the distilling process. Uh, the only area that I'm aware of outside of Kentucky where there was a, a concentration was Peoria, Illinois. There were 13 distilleries lined up along the Illinois River at Peoria, but these were large scale rectifying distilleries which did not produce fine whiskey as Kentucky distilleries did. Uh, they were producing for a quick sale, uh, cheap product, uh, and uh, of course prohibition turned that into industrial uh, alcohol distilling and they never recovered. Uh, it, it's, and, and if you get uh, farther back uh, in time into the 1810s, 20s, and 30s, uh, the, the U U.S. map of where distilleries were uh, becomes more a matter of reputation than it does of fact uh, in terms of, of pinning down what the distribution would have been. But suffice it to say that anecdotally, there were a large number of distilleries uh, in the eastern United States. The most, fa most famous, famous group from that period is probably uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, from which, as a result of Alexander Hamilton's tax, uh, a lot of distillers fled, many of which uh, moved here to Kentucky. Absolutely. And along those lines, we had a really great question from the chat come in uh, about taxation, regulation, licensing. When does that start? And does that also drive the, the sort of the, the small producers out and lead to more concentration? Uh, this this is, a, is a complicated subject. And um, you might have a look at Chester Zoller's uh, book on uh, bourbon distilling. He has a uh, spelled this out in almost tabular form, but uh, uh, the the taxation and, and federal monitoring starts very early on. Uh, the Revolutionary War, Alexander Hamilton is trying to pay for that by dis uh, taxing distillers. And the in terms of Kentucky distillers, the, the big jump comes as I mentioned in 1868, uh, with a uh, very complicated set of requirements and a uh, full-blown surveillance system uh, that is put in place by the federal government through the Internal Revenue people uh, that uh, end up putting, as I, as I commented when we were looking at one of the Paul Sawyer paintings of that uh, uh, shopkeepers, that's what they were called, shopkeepers, 
and Gager's uh, office, that little uh, cabin that we saw on the on the distillery. Uh, if you visit the Willet Distillery today, uh, you will see what appears to be uh, the original uh, shopkeepers and gaugers uh, shack is still there out in front of the distillery. So uh, the, the, I have an extensive section on this in the, in the book that uh, will uh, not, not deal with it in uh, deep, deep detail, but enough so that you can get a pretty good idea of how difficult it was to distill uh, and market your product under that system. I know we've got a lot of really fantastic questions in the chat. I would point out too that Dr. Rates's email is in there. If you do have any questions for him, please do follow up. There he was sharing a story about how he uh, had a really wonderful uh, reader get in touch with him uh, about a family connection they found through the book. So maybe we'll all find some hidden gems in there. I wanna close with, with one more quick question. We talked a lot about the changes in the, in the technology um, and in the scale of production. Um, had, did we see over this time period any, any changes in the recipe itself? Well, um, I, I'm not privy to secret recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's a lot of public information and certainly uh, if you talk to distillers, they're very willing to tell you uh, uh, what they're all about. Uh, the, the 19th century uh, distillers uh, maybe did some of that, but you also, uh, if you're reading their records that they kept, uh, those that are available for public view anyway, uh, were sometimes very guarded uh, about what their, really, what their recipes were. A lot of them viewed themselves as being in strong competition not only for total sales, but also for reputation. Uh, who makes the best whiskey? And you'll, you'll see this written in hard copy. It's not just something that we make up. And uh, uh, there, there's, I mentioned hops was one of the ingredients that um, James Stone was bringing in. And uh, until I started this, this project about 12 years ago, I was not aware that hops have been employed in the distilling industry. But in the case of several of the distillers, uh, including I think Henry McKenna, who also used hops, they were using it to make yeast, not necessarily mixing it in uh, to create flavors as you would with beer. Well, that's really fascinating. It sounds like we all have a lot to learn from this book. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thanks to everyone else who's, who's logged in with us.